the Clinical Podcast Series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. Today's episode is from the Clinical Contact Lens and Myopia Care Channel entitled Age-Related Changes in Corneal Sensitivity. I'd like to thank our host and lead topical editor, Dr. Andrew Pucker, and our topical expert today, Dr. Caleb Abbott. And now it's my pleasure to begin today's podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the American Academy of Optometry Foundation's clinical podcast series. I'm Dr. Andrew Pucker. I'll be your guest host today. I'm a fellow and diplomate of the uh, cornea contact lens and refractive technology section. And today I'm here with Caleb Abbott, who is also a fellow of the Academy. Um, could you please give us a little bit about yourself, Caleb? Yeah, uh, I am an optometrist and an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Colorado. Uh, I work in our dry eye clinic here, so primarily my job entails um, being in clinic and treating ocular surface diseases, and namely dry eye, then also doing dry eye research and clinical trials for dry eye treatments. Awesome. And I asked Caleb to be here today specifically because of the paper we're discussing, which is age-related changes in cordial sensitivity. He has a lot of experience with neurotrophic keratitis, those sort of things, so um, Caleb, could you just give us a little overview of this paper to get everyone in the, in the mood for the paper? Yeah, so um, I think in the dry eye, in the ocular surface world, really only within the last five years or so have we begun to understand the vital role of corneal nerves and how it pertains to pain and sensation. So this first paper was really going over age-related changes and corneal sensitivity, and we've utilized corneal uh, sensation testing for decades when we suspect that there may be an underlying herpes simplex keratitis. Um, but we don't oftentimes use it in refractory dry eye cases where there might be an underlying corneal nerve problem. Cool. So one of the main things um, in this paper is using two different types of devices to test corneal sensitivity. One is Cochet Bonnet, which we're all familiar with, and then there's this liquid jet uh, system that is the focus of this paper. Could you please tell us a little bit about the limitations of maybe even both of these devices? Yeah, uh, there are definitely limitations with both. Um, I, I think currently I, I actually see a little bit more limitations with the liquid jet esthesiometer than I do Cochet Bonnet. Um, so liquid jet utilizes a lot of nice features like temperature control, pH control, um, and tear osmolarity control to essentially try to isolate a mechanically induced sensation um, using an air puff, but also um, liquid droplets inside that air puff. Uh, Cochet Bonnet does the really the exact same thing, but without these additional features uh, because it's already testing just the mechanical um, sensation. And really the mechanical sensation is gonna be detected by two different nociceptors of the cornea, the polymodal nociceptor and the mechano nociceptor. Um, now, Cochet Bonnet um, is a little bit limited in terms of making sure that you perform it correctly. Um, so it's potentially a little bit less reliable, uh, whereas the liquid jet is a little bit more automated. So I think that there's less room for error when you're doing that testing. Uh, but I think that one kind of key limiting factor with this study was that it really only tested one location of the cornea. So Cochet Bonnet, they tested inferiorly, and then with the uh, liquid jet esthesiometer, they tested centrally. And oftentimes when I'm doing testing for neurotrophic keratitis, uh, I actually find that there's a sectoral component of it. Whereas in one quadrant, you might have a relatively normal sensation, then other quadrants, a markedly reduced sensation. And it's a little bit unclear to me whether or not the liquid jet esthesiometers are able to actually detect the sectoral neurotrophic keratitis where Cochet Bonnet, it's pretty easy to do. Really, I'm testing centrally and then testing superior, inferior, nasal, and temporal with all of my patients. Um, having said that, liquid jet esthesiometry, esthesiometry is probably a little bit more sensitive um, than Cochet Bonnet, which is what we see in this study, uh, we saw that it reached a significant p-value with um, the liquid jet, but it was only trending with the Cochet Bonnet. So liquid jet's probably a little bit more reliable and a little bit more sensitive. Um, 
but potentially is more difficult at detecting sectoral changes and also is quite a bit more expensive than cochet bonnet, which is really just a filament uh, attached to a pen. Yeah, there's definitely some pros and cons. The cochet bonnet has a plateau effect, especially in normal people. So, you know, you, you can only make this, the thread go out so far before or get so close before, you know, you have different abilities to detect. And, and a lot of time you just can't really get down to the real threshold of a, a normal person. So I think that's where the liquid jet's coming in. And that may actually be an important point for this study because we're looking at normal patients, right? Not mm -hmm. neurotrophicaritis. So how do you think the results of this study were affected by just having normal patients? Um, yeah, obviously this study was just looking at normal, not, not looking at any ocular or systemic conditions. But I think with corneal sensation, we're still really trying to evaluate normals at this point. Um, there really aren't a whole lot of normal set with Cochet Bonnet in terms of saying, well, a, a completely normal patient, you know, it's X number of centimeters for us to tell, for us to say that th this is considered normal. So we're still trying to establish normals and still trying to uh, figure out kind of the best esthesiometer to use. Um, now, if you were to look at specific ocular conditions or systemic conditions, um, which hopefully will be done in the future, then you can establish normals based on different types of conditions. And that's been done to some extent, probably namely with diabetes, because we do know that diabetes causes reduced uh, corneal sensation, but it hasn't been evaluated in many other conditions. Yeah, for sure. So I know that this device, and I don't think we fully said this, the liquid jet is not in the market yet. They're still developing it. And this is a bit of a proof of concept, which is why they're comparing it to Cochet Bonnet. But say this technology actually makes it to market. How can we use these results clinically? Um, I, I think corneal sensation testing is going to become a bigger part um, of dry eye testing in general, um, just because a lot of the refractory dry eye cases we're starting to realize, um, you know, after you try all sorts of treatments and nothing's really helpful, um, you start to realize, oh, there's probably a stage one neurotrophic component here. And I think neurotrophic keratitis is um, probably vastly underdiagnosed right now in the country. It's estimated that only about 65,000 people have it. But I have a feeling that a lot of the dry eye cases that, that we as clinicians see every day is really just stage one neurotrophic keratitis um, that someone hasn't done corneal sensation testing for. And it's, I think studies like this are important to understand age-related changes in cases of a bilateral neurotrophic keratitis because you do not have a control eye to test it to. But um, so with unilateral neurotrophic keratitis, you test the good eye and you can see what the sensation is. And then you test the affected eye and you can see that there's a reduction in sensitivity. But it's a lot harder to clinically make judgments if both eyes are affected by neurotrophic keratitis. So understanding how age plays a role in corneal sensation, I think is very important. That's great. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you a curveball here. So since you see a lot of NK patients and you think it's underdiagnosed, is there any other like patient symptoms or signs or anything that you can help you know, the, the listeners more easily detect these people so they get the right kind of care? Yeah, I think so. Most of these NK patients, um, it, it's a little bit confusing when you first see them because you see a lot of corneal epitheliopathy, but they're not having really usually any symptoms other than blurred vision. So whereas a normal patient that would have this would be in quite a bit of discomfort and have a whole lot of ocular discomfort symptoms. Really, these patients are coming in saying, really my only symptom is blurred vision, um, mm -hmm. but the comfort is overall pretty good. And that should be your first indication that there might be a neurotrophic component that's the underlying cause here. And then you can do corneal sensitivity testing to confirm that. Well, that's great. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts on this paper or on this topic in general? Um, just that I, I think corneal sensitivity testing is should be utilized a little bit more often in refractory dry eye cases. Um, I think a lot of times when people think of neurotrophic keratitis, we're thinking about more severe cases like the stage two and stage three, where you're getting persistent epithelial defects and or you're getting ulcers with some stromal thinning. But 
it's likely that the vast majority of these cases are really the stage one cases that are just being misdiagnosed as typical dry eye. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank you, Caleb, for being here today. I'd also like to thank the, the listeners for tuning in to another podcast series. Thank you. And a special thanks to Cooper Vision for their educational grant to make it all happen.